Genesis chapter number 17, we will begin reading in verse number 15. <clears throat> and God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall, be, shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Okie dokie. Just to catch you all up. We're only 17 chapters in. Not much can happen, right? Wrong. Anyway. Abram. Used to be his name. Abram was a man that lived after God. Okay, God did not call Abram because he lived wickedly. God called Abram because Abram lived a life after God. Okay, just as Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, because Noah lived a life that glorified the Lord, so did Abram before God called Abram. Okay? Then as Abram, he follows the Lord around for a couple of years. God changes his name to Abraham. Throughout that period, God provides the way they can avoid a famine. God provides so that he can rescue his nephew Lot when he gets taken into captivity. And then when he goes to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, God also allows Abram, or Abraham at that point to not only petition for the life of Lot, but for the entire city. Abram, Abraham talked God down from 100 righteous people to 10. He stopped. God didn't stop. Not going to teach on any of that. But Abraham thought if there's 10 righteous people in the city, God will save it. Thought that Lot would save his family or lead his family to the Lord. Lot did not do that. Four of them left. Three of them made it because one turned around and looked back at the city and was turned into a pillar of salt. And then Abraham keeps on living for the Lord. By this point, Abraham has wanted a child. His wife, Sarai, has wanted a child. Sarai cannot have a child. Abraham, he's getting up there. Thirteen years before this day, Ishmael was born. Abraham's hundred years old. 99 and, and uh, 13 years before that 86 year old man had a son All right, we thought brother Phil was old when Kaylee was born and he got nothing on Abraham but wanted a son so Ishmael was born of her handmaid okay then we get to this day in Abraham's life okay the beginning of the chapter God says I'm going to make a covenant with you covenant will not be through Ishmael. The covenant will be through Isaac. Okay, so if you want to know why Isaac, not Ishmael, it's because God chose Isaac. Okay? The Lord even asked, or Abraham even asked the Lord, he said, why can't you bless me through Ishmael? I'm 99 years old. Sarah, she's 90 years old. Or 89. How in the world are we going to have a kid? Right? Just use Ishmael. It's not the way that God wanted to do it. But we're not going to teach on any of that today. That's to get you caught up. Okay? Only 17 chapters. And not all of those had to do with Abraham. Anyway. We get down to verse number 15. In verse number 1, God says, I'm going to, or in verse number 2, he says, and I will make my covenant between me and thee. Okay? Now keep in mind, Abraham's already been selected of God. Okay, he's following God around. He's a nomad. He lives where God tells him to live and moves when God tells him to move. Okay, that's how he lives his life. Every day is that way. He goes where the Lord says. He leads the servants, the cattle, all the people that are with him. Because Abraham was a wealthy man. You can go read before God called him. The Bible said that Abram was wealthy in cattle, gold, and silver. Okay, he had a lot. He wasn't wanting. But gold and silver doesn't feed cattle. Okay, they need grass. They need water. They need to move around or else they'll eat everything and then nothing will be left. If they eat everything, nothing will grow ever again. Okay, so Abraham, and then later, as God changed his name to Abraham, moving around, relying on the grace of God. Before God called him, he relied on the grace of God. Each and every one of us rely on the grace of God every day, whether we realize it or not. But we're not going to teach on that. But as he's moving around, God shows him some things. God teaches him some things. And here at this point, 
He had already been called. He had already been selected. God had already changed his name, showing that he had matured or will mature into the man that God would have him to be. And then, when he's 99 years old, God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Okay? No covenant before him. A lot of people think that God called Abram and said, hey, covenant. Not, not so. Abraham, even though as Abram, he had been faithful to live after, live after God, had to get to the place where God could make a covenant with him. And when God chose to make the covenant with him, God said, I'm going to do great things for you. But there are some conditions. Okay, look at verse number 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me, and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. Okay? Conditions. Verse number 1. He's 90 and 9. The Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Two conditions there. Okay? He appeared to Abram and said, Walk before me. That does not mean Abraham was, or Abram, verse number 15, he's Abraham, so forgive me if I start mixing them up. But Abram was not supposed to walk in front of God and lead God around. That is not what walk before me means. Okay? Old timey English, 1611. Walk before me does not mean take me where you think we ought to go. Walk before me means walk so that I can observe you. Before me, before my gaze. Okay, God is thrones in the sides of the north. Everything's below him. But he says, walk before me or present yourself. Live your life in such a way that you are ever in front of me so that I can see you and observe you. Now, God's omnipresent. He sees everything at once. But what this means is walk what God tells us to walk so that we are before his face. Okay, we are supposed to seek the face of God. But he's saying, live a life before me that I tell you to live. But then, second part it says, and be thou perfect. Now again, Old Testament, Hebrew. Perfect does not mean sinless. I once got into an argument that I won with a college professor who thought he was right, who said in my introduction to religions class, that Job was sinless because the Bible said so. I said, nope. Luckily, this guy claimed to be Jewish, which means he had a dictionary at home that was Hebrew. So I corrected him on it. He said, if you're right, I'll buy you lunch. I said, I don't want to gamble on it. I just want you to teach these people the truth. He wasn't happy when he came back the next class and said, you was right. I said, I know. That's why I said it. If I was wrong, I wouldn't have said it. Perfect does not mean sinless. Okay, you can go and read the book of Job. Don't even have to get very far. Okay, Job was an upright man, a perfect man, the Bible says, who feared God and eschewed evil. Nowhere in that does it say sinless. Upright means that he had the right principles. He eschewed evil, it means that he hated the things that God said to hate. Okay, but perfect does not mean that he walked around with a halo. God is not telling Abram, you have to be sinless in order to receive this covenant between me and thee. What he's saying is, your faith must be complete. Perfect means not lacking anything. Okay? I can have the perfect faith that I'm supposed to have in a sin-corrupted body. Because my faith is not tied to my body. God gave unto every man a measure of faith. We can exercise that faith and grow that faith. And that faith can be put into God or it can be put into the world. But either way, my faith can be complete in God. My faith can be lacking nothing. My body will still be sin cursed. God's not telling Abram that if you live the way that I'm supposed to tell you, then you'll be able to achieve righteousness. He's getting ready to make the covenant with him that, and then promise to give him Isaac. Okay? Isaac would go on to have a son named Jacob who would later be called Israel who... God chose Israel to, down through the lineage, 
You can go study it out. Start with Boaz, who had a wife named Ruth, who had a son named Obed, who had a uh, son named Jesse, who had a son named David, who later became king over Israel. God chose David's lineage to birth the Lord Jesus Christ into the world through the lineage of David. Okay, all of that. The plan that we just sang about, okay, the one that Brother Clinton, when he was praying, said he got so excited about, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. This is about step five in salvation's plan that God had pinned before the foundations of the world. Okay, God knew what he was doing. So he's not telling Abram, you can be perfect. You can be sinless. He's making this covenant to make a way for a sin-cursed world to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. He's not telling them you can be sinless. He's telling them you can live a life that will please me even though you're in a sin-cursed body, in a sin-cursed world. You can walk a life that's before me and I will be pleased. And he's saying, do that. Because I'm getting ready to make a covenant with you. Then verse number 15. Now his name's Abraham. 15, and God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her or shall her name be. Okay, now Sarai and Sarah, two different names. If you've been around here long enough, as I have learned, you will also have learned that names are very important in the Bible. They mean things. A man, when he got to the age of 40, if his name did not represent his lifestyle, they would change his name so that his name did represent who he was. Somebody's name meant something back in the day. Jacob, before God changed his name to Israel, that meant usurper. Because he did usurp his older brother Esau. Even though they were twins, Esau came out first. That made him the oldest. Okay? But he usurped Esau. Okay? He was a trickster. A supplanter. Jacob, that name, and the lifestyle that he had before he met God, was one that he toppled people. Okay? We're either stepping stones or stumbling blocks to other people. We either help lead them in the direction to the Lord, or they trip over us and die and go to hell. Jacob was one of them stumbling blocks before God changed his name to Israel because he was no longer that way. Okay, Jacob embraced the angel of the Lord after they had rested all night and by faith said, I won't let you go until you bless me. This is the angel of the Lord. That's Old Testament for Jesus. Jesus could have got away from Jacob if Jesus wanted to get away from Jacob. But Jesus allowed himself to be held on to by Jacob to see how much he really wanted to get a hold of God. Then God blessed him, touched the hollow of his hip. His hip was out of joint. Jacob, or Israel, walked with a cane for the rest of his life. Okay? People leave different after they meet Jesus. Jacob wouldn't have had to have the hollow of his hip touched in order to get closer to God if Jacob would have lived a life that was right before the Lord. He got the birthright from Esau because he tricked him out of it. He got the blessing from his father Isaac because he lied and put hair all over himself and pretended to be Esau. Not honorable things. Not perfect. Not walking before the Lord. But the Lord got a hold of Jacob's attention. Okay? Jacob, from that point on, was a great patriarch. Lived before the Lord in a way that his 12 sons, who later became the 12 patriarchs of Israel, all had proper instructions and a proper example on how they should live before the Lord. That's what God's trying to show here with the name change between Sarai and Sarah. Anybody want to take a stab at what Sarai means? Okay, I'll tell you. It means princess. We all know what a princess is. We have seen Disney movies, yes? We all know what a princess is. A princess is the daughter of a king and queen. Okay, now Sarah. Very similar, but different. Sarah means a noble woman. Okay? And we get back to that in a second. But as I was reading this, God pointed out. The world may look at us and say, Sarah and Sarah are pretty much the same. He still looks like the same, Brother Bob. He still looks like the same, Brother Josh. He's saying that something's changed. It's, it's not that big a change. Almost all the letters are the same. But if they look, they'll see a difference. They'll notice hey, they're not the same way that they used to be. I may look the same. I may talk the same. I may 
have the same mannerisms. I may still get loud in the same you know, manner that I used to before. But if you look long enough, you'll see I'm different. You may not catch it the first time that Abraham says, Sarah, said to Sarah, very similar, depending on an accent, maybe indistinguishable. But he knew, Sarah knew, God knew, and eventually everybody else knew <clears throat> that her name got changed. Now, why did God make such a small change to make such a distinction between princess and noblewoman? Okay, I promise we're almost to the thought. Princess. Someone whose rank comes from their family. A princess is someone that has royal blood. God's telling Abraham and God's telling Sarah, you can be perfect. You can walk before me all the days of your life. But I'm getting ready to bless you with Isaac, who's going to be blessed with Esau and Jacob, who's going to be blessed with the 12 tribes of Israel, who out of one of the 12 tribes of Israel, my son will be born into your family. Okay? Now, it's prophesied later on in the Old Testament that Jesus would be the king of Israel, that he would sit on the throne of David. Okay? Later on, God made a king out of David, and that's the lineage that Jesus was born through. So why wouldn't he just start the family tree with royalty, with a princess? That would have made Jacob and Esau princes. God's saying, I don't care where your family bloodlines came from. If man's blood was good enough, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. God's making the distinction. It's not in who you are. It is in who I am. A princess or a prince or a king or a queen get their station from the family bloodline. If you're born outside the family, you can't be a princess. God's saying we're not including a certain group. We're not excluding another certain group. I'm not worried about in what the world thinks that you are. Abraham looked out, man. He married a princess. Anybody in here ever married a princess? Abraham did. God's saying, doesn't impress me. The answer to that question is no. Nobody in here has ever married someone that had a name claim or birthright claim to a, the throne of a nation. Okay? This is not the princess diaries. Okay? Anyway. Yeah, my movie references aren't as old as the other guys. But anyway. Back to the point. God's saying, I don't care who your family is. I don't care what station you were born into. He's saying, your blood's not good enough. It's got to take the blood of God to redeem sins. You can live a life that I'm pleased with, but you can't take away your own sins. He's saying, you can do what I tell you to do, but I know that you'll fail. He knew that Adam and Eve would fail. He knew that even though he gave us the law, that he'd have to make a way that we could make sacrifices so that sin could be atoned for. Even after we get saved, if we're faithful to confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Why? Because even though my soul is saved, my body is not. I still need forgiveness for sins. Even though my soul is redeemed on its way to heaven, there's flesh. Every now and then, rears up out of control, or it missteps, or a thought just enters my head that I didn't have any chance to stop. I've got to seek forgiveness for that. That's walking before the Lord. That's being perfect in my faith, seeking to live a life before God. But God's saying, I don't care where you came from. It's not about who you are in the world. It's about who you can be through me. Now, the second name, Sarah. Noble woman. That seems very similar to princess. Okay, princess, noble woman, nobles, king and queen. Very different things. Now you say, well, what is a noble? Well, under feudal systems, a noble was somebody that was almost a princess and it, because it was corrupted. All right? The word noble or nobility best definition I can give you true nobility is not being superior to your fellow man it is being superior to your former self nobility is not about judging who I am based off of who you are that's how the world did it that's how you got the messed up feudal system with nobility because we look around and we say well I'm better than so and so or I live better than this person so I deserve a title 
That's how the world defined nobility. God changed their name to noble woman. He's saying, live a life that is noble. After he has instructed her husband to live a life before the Lord and that is perfect. After God saves us, he tells us to be perfect to walk before him. But he didn't call us princesses or princes. That would mean that I'm, I'm just what I should be. A prince, when he's born, is everything that he needs to be. He's the son of the king. Now I've received the adoption of sonship. I'm a joint heir to the throne of God, but I am not the king of glory. I am not the prince of all of glory. That's Jesus. He's the Lord of the Lord and King of Kings. He did make me a king and a priest to rule and reign over this body, but I've got no authority over anybody else. I've got no authority over you. Even the under-shepherd of a church, the pastor, has authority over the church, but it's God's flock. God gave him the authority over this flock. God's still in control. I have no right. I have no you know, position to tell you what, to, what you can do or what you can't do to make decisions for you. That's called slavery. God's not interested in it. Okay? God gave us all the choice to either walk after him or not walk after him. If he would have called us princes, it would have been, after we got saved, a prince can do whatever he wants. His dad's the king. Who's going to tell a prince no? Okay, maybe the king, but nobody out in the world would ever tell a prince no. God's not interested in a bunch of spoiled princes and princesses running around. He called us to be noble. And again, true nobility is not being better than somebody else. It's about being better than who I used to be. If I strive to continue to work upon myself to get to that point where the Lord looks at me and says, your faith is perfect. Your devotion to me is perfect. The way that you live your life before me, the way that you walk before me, is perfect. Yeah, you mess up, but you know that when you mess up, you need to make it right so that you can continue walking. He called us to be nobility. Am I better than the rest of the world? No, because I'm still trapped in a sin-cursed body. I was still born with the same sin-cursed blood. The only difference is I found a cure to the problem. I'm not better than them. In fact, I should desire for them to be like me. But I cannot judge them as if they are less than me. They're the same thing I am, only they haven't found Jesus. My station didn't change when God saved me. Yeah, I'm a son of the king, but I'm also just another person. He loved us all the same. He didn't love me any more after I got saved than he did before I got saved. The only difference is, is that I chose to love him because he loved me. I chose to accept that love and to receive that gift. The love that drew salvation's plan. Doesn't make me better than anybody else. But after I get saved, I should be better today than I was yesterday. I should have been better yesterday than I was the day before. I can always become more perfect in my faith, in my walk with God. That's why God didn't want a princess to give birth to Isaac that would later give birth to kings. Okay? Well, look at verse number 16. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she will be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Kings of people, lowercase k. God allows those in power to rise up. He unseats those that are in power. Nobody comes to power without the Lord. All power belongs to him. If he allows someone to rise to power, it's because he's letting them borrow it for a second. Or he's giving them permission to do that, to be in that position. What he's trying to tell Abraham here is, I can make things that you never could imagine happen. But the kings that he's talking about were not the ones that could save mankind the nations that he's talking about were not the ones that would be able to do anything to redeem sin he's saying I'm going to make a great nation out and nations will be out of her because Jacob and Esau after Isaac okay two great nations that went and became two great people or two great groups of people okay then kings would come out of her well Saul was a child of Israel. David was a child of Israel. Solomon was a child of Israel. And on and on and on and on. Lots of kings. 
but none of them fit, fit the bill. They weren't the answer. They weren't the ones that God was interested in bringing about through Sarah. Saying her blood's not important. Those kings, in all actuality, if they did what I said to do, if they walked before me, if they were perfect in their faith, then I can use their life to bring about what I want to happen. And eventually, down through the lineage of David, find a man named Joseph who was espoused to a lady named Mary who became pregnant without ever knowing a man, and Jesus was born. That's the point. If Joseph's blood, because of Sarah, and where his bloodline came from, was good enough, Joseph would have been Jesus' father. But no, Mary conceived without ever having known a man because his blood came from the Father, the Heavenly Father. So God's not interested in who we are. He's interested in who we can be through Him. So with that thought, I want to teach on this morning, noble Christian. Noble Christian. My desire today should be to be closer to God than I was yesterday. Because again, true nobility is being better than my former self. I should want to be a better Christian today than I was yesterday. I should desire to be closer to God today than I was yesterday. Nowhere in my life should I say, this is good. I'm going to park it here. I think this is a, a good spot, pitch tent, live out the rest of my days. Why? Because a Christian's mindset should never be, okay, should always be, press on. But also, if I stop, God keeps moving. I may think that I'll stay as close as I am to God today for forever if I just stop here. But God keeps moving. God's always got a direction for me to head. And the longer I stay stationary, the further I get away from God. That is not being more noble today than I was yesterday. That's being more carnal than I was yesterday. That's wanting to feast upon my own lust of taking a break, sitting here. God's not interested in that. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Perfect is not a state of permanency. I can have a perfect faith today. Doesn't mean that I'll have a perfect faith tomorrow. Job had perfect faith before God allowed the devil to take everything from him. Still had perfect faith at the end, which is why God rewarded him with double of everything that he had. And he was already the richest man in the East. So now he's twice as rich as everybody else. They were really complaining about the 99% and the 1%. Job himself was the 1%. He owned everything, and then he owned twice as much as that. Okay, why? Because his faith was perfect, and God was pleased with the testing of his faith, the trial of his faith. Okay, my faith can be perfect today. Doesn't mean it's going to be perfect tomorrow. God wouldn't have let Job be tempted if his faith couldn't have handled that temptation. God does not allow us to be tempted above that which we are able. Now, I've said it before. God, the Bible makes it very clear. God does not tempt us. What kind of God would he be if he said, Be thou perfect, have a perfect faith before me, and then tempt us to do wrong? He wouldn't be God. The temptation comes from the devil. But God doesn't allow the devil to do anything that we cannot handle. Knowing that, knowing that he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother, that he told me to take his yoke upon me because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Knowing that he said, take up thy cross and follow me. All three of those. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He's walking right next to me. I'm yoked up with him. That means we're both in the same contraption. He's walking right next to me. Take up thy cross and follow me. He's leading the way. Yeah, I've got a burden, but his burden was much heavier. The path that he blazed is straight, and it may not be an easy road to walk, but he led it before us in the flesh. He was tempted in all points like as unto we are, yet was he without sin. He lived a life for 33 and a half years of perfect sinless perfection. He showed us that everything that he told us to do, he accomplished through the flesh. He also fulfilled the law, which no man can do, but he also lived a perfect life before the Lord to show us that we could also do that. We can live a life with a perfect faith that we can please the Father. And all I have to do is take up my cross and follow after him. He's not asking me to do anything different than he did himself. God's not being unfair here. He's not telling us 
okay, well, I jumped over the small hurdle. You go jump over the big hurdle. It wouldn't be God if he did that. He just tells us to have faith in him, to walk before him, and to be perfect. I should want to take up that easy, because he's going to help me. He's right next to me. We've already covered it. He equipped me, but I also rely upon his strength. I'm supposed to stand, and having done all to stand, stand there for. God doesn't always tell me to fight. Sometimes I just got to stand there. God does the fighting. But I've got to rely upon his strength to say, Lord, I'm getting a little tired. Moses' arms got tired when he was standing up on top of the mountain. And when his hands were in the air, Israel prevailed in the battle. And Aaron and her, they saw the man of God was getting a little weak. Moses needed some help. You think that Aaron and her had that idea on their own? No, God put that thought in there. Hey, we need to help the man of God. And in all honesty, they may have been helping Moses, but what they were doing was helping fulfill the will of God. It was the will of God that Israel would prevail. They set Moses down on the stone, and they held his arms up in the air. Because when his strength failed, God always makes a way for his strength to prevail. If I'm relying on God, it'll be done. If I'm relying on me, I'll fail. Those are all things that we learn as our faith becomes more complete. I can't charge hell with a gasoline tank the day after I get saved and expect to be victorious in any way. Why? Because one, I'm relying upon me charging hell with a gasoline tank. Two, God didn't tell me to do that. Three, if God didn't tell me to do it, he's not going to help me do it. And four, if I'm the one that thinks I can take on the devil, I'm going to get flattened every time. In all honesty, the devil's not even concerned with that guy. He sends one of his imps out to handle that. My faith should be more perfect. The day I got saved, my desire the next day should have been, okay, Lord, show me how to get closer to you. And that should be the same desire I wake up with every day. Noble Christians have a more perfect walk. Yeah, I may have messed up yesterday. Yeah, I may have lost my temper yesterday. Yeah, I may not have said the thing that I was supposed to yesterday, but the Lord may give me an opportunity to apologize for it today, to admit that I was wrong, to show somebody else, hey, I know I flew it. I know I was wrong. Please forgive me. They may not forgive you, but the Lord may tell me to keep asking for forgiveness over and over and over again. If I'm not interested in doing that, I'm not becoming a more perfect person because I'm not interested in becoming who God wants me to be. A more perfect walk does not mean a perfect walk. You don't get saved and then boom, the next day. You're living victoriously as a Christian. You've achieved the pinnacle of your spirituality. And from that day forward, you will be exactly what God wants you to be. A Christian life is a life of plateaus. You, work, you climb up a mountain, maybe hard, but then God allows you to live in that spot for a while. Why? Because he put you through all the work so you could do something for him. Then once you accomplish it, God will again begin training you. There will be effort. There will be trials. He may put you in the furnace, but it's all for a point to make us more perfect so that the potter can shape the clay so that we can become a vessel of honor. Didn't Jeremiah say that the potter knows how to fashion one vessel into a vessel of honor and another into a vessel of dishonor? God can get glory out of our life. Either way, Pharaoh, who didn't want to let the people of Israel go out of Egypt, God fashioned him into a vessel of dishonor because he would not be a vessel of honor. He had many opportunities to let the children of God go. And each time he said no. His heart, heart got harder and harder and harder. Pharaoh had many opportunities to not only let the children of God go, but to say, your God that did all these things, He's the real God. All these Egyptian gods that we got, each one of the plagues conquered a different Egyptian god. Proved that their gods didn't have any power. Pharaoh could have put his faith into the God of Moses, the God of Israel, but he didn't choose to. He became less and less like what God wanted him to become, and then God destroyed him, drowned him in the Red Sea after he collapsed it, after he had parted it, and Israel had walked across on dry land. But my walk can either get closer to God or further away from God. My witness can be more perfect. First day you get saved, you can tell somebody else, 
how you got saved, how to be saved. Because really, once you get saved, you can tell somebody else how to get saved. But you may not be able to answer all the questions that they have. You may not be able to give the insight or the experience or the wisdom that somebody else may ask of you. Another Christian may come to you and say, hey, have you ever faced this before? Have you ever had this question before? Have you ever had this happen to you before? And you can go to the Bible and say, yeah, this is what I did because this is what the Bible says. Okay? I can become more perfect in my witness, in my outward expression of what God has put into my life. Now, I'm not telling you to go and take a witnessing course because chances are it's all going to be a bunch of baloney. Salesmanship. God's not interested in salesmanship. He's interested in being more perfect so that you can be more genuine when you witness. This is what God's done for me. I put my faith in Him and He didn't let me down. Each day, I just keep leaning on Him more and more. And each day gets sweeter as the days go by. Not because I'm doing anything, because God has made it that way. Even on the bad days, He's still just as sweet as He ever was. Our witness should be able to more effectively reach others. Because I've spent more time in the Word. I've spent more time listening to God. I've spent more time around people, getting to know them so that I can make a difference in their life. Abraham, or Abram beforehand, when he gave the decision to Lot, Lot, you want this plane of grass? You want that plane of grass? We'll go different directions. Abraham went away from Sodom and Gomorrah. All the cities that Abraham visited, none of them were destroyed with fire. Before God called Abram, everybody knew he followed after God. Abram had a witness that said, I know who God is, and I choose to follow him, and he's taking care of me. Lot, on the other hand, lost everything that God had ever given him, traded it all the way for station, and then when two angels came to fetch him, even though he was trying to protect the angels from the wicked men in the city, even though the angels could take care of themselves, I guarantee you that. Go read other examples where God used angels to exact his vengeance or his justice on people. Angels could have taken care of themselves. Lot offered up his two virgin daughters and said, no, nah, don't, don't mess with them. Take, take my daughters instead. His witness did not win Sodom and Gomorrah. But none of the cities that Abraham visited or camped near Never find where they were destroyed with fire and brimstone. Abraham had the superior witness. May not have been perfect, but it was more perfect. As he went on, he had more to tell about what God had done for him. If you live for God, God will just keep showing in your life to other people how great a God he is. But if I stop living for God, how can I expect other people to see God working in my life? My witness should be more perfect. I should have more to tell today than I did yesterday. After he disciples us, he sends us out. He may bring us back. The Apostle Paul didn't write one epistle. How many messages did the Lord give to the Apostle Paul? How many messages did he give to Luke? Luke wrote two books. John wrote five. Moses wrote the first five of the Old Testament. Jeremiah may have only written one book. That's a long book. That's a lot of chapters. That's longer than any devotion I've ever written. But the point is, the witness continues to evolve. He'll always give you something to say, somebody to go to. He'll always give you a purpose, a desire, a burden, something to do for him. My witness should be more perfect. I should be able to do, even if it's the same thing I did yesterday, I should be able to do it better for the Lord. I should allow the Lord to show me where I went wrong or how I can improve, and I should do it better today. Okay, but as Christians, our discernment, should be more perfect. Elijah, after he had prayed down fire from heaven, gets a threat from the evil queen Je Jezebel, says, hey, you're going to die. He says, oh no. Runs underneath the juniper tree. Only time that we ever find that Elijah was down in the things of the Lord. That his faith wasn't as strong as we had seen throughout the rest of it. But because of his faith being tested one the Bible says that the angel of the Lord came down and fed him Jesus came down and gave Elijah lunch you ever gotten lunch from Jesus I didn't think so 
5,000 men plus the women and children got lunch from Jesus one day. But I've never had lunch from Jesus. Whatever Elijah was fed, best meal he's ever had. In fact, it was so good, he went 40 days without eating again. Okay, there's a message in there. We're not going to preach it. But because of the low point, God took him to the place where he went into a cave in the side of a mountain. And he saw a whirlwind. He saw thunder. He heard it. And in everything that God showed him, he said, God wasn't in that. But God was in a still small voice. Elijah learned something more from God because his faith was tested. But I should be able to hear the still small voice easier today than I did yesterday. I should know when I'm reading the Word of God more today than I did yesterday when God says, whoop, stop there, go back and read that. Sit on that for a while. Meditate on that. Or I should know when I'm sitting in church listening to pre preaching, I should know more today than I did yesterday that voice that says, hey, that was for you. Or hey, shout on that one. Or hey, write that down, you're going to need that another day. Or hey, just pay attention because you're going to have to tell this to somebody tomorrow on the job. I should know that still small voice better today than I did yesterday. I should know when the Lord says go that way or go this way better today than I did yesterday. It may take me the first day a while to sit in before I hear the still small voice. I may have to sit through the whirlwind, through the fire, through the thunder. I may have to sit through an earthquake. But if I wait, I'll hear the still small voice. It may not take as long the next time for me to hear the still small voice. Or maybe God knows that one day we're going to have to wait a while before he's ready to tell us what he wants us to hear in the still small voice. So he's building our patience. Either way, I should be more attuned to his voice, but I should also be w willing to wait as long as it takes to hear from God. I should never throw my hands up and say, God said wait and he hadn't said anything. It means that God still wants you to wait. But if my patience is not more perfect than it was yesterday, if I've decided, all right, I'll wait here, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to stop growing. I'll, I'll be the same until Jesus tells me to do something. He wanted you to sit here so you could grow more to be prepared for the journey he wants you to take. My discernment should be more perfect. But what other portions of our faith can be more perfect? Okay, My diligence to perform my duties. I should be more perfect in my reading, in my praying. I should be more perfect in my meditation upon the things of God. Pray without ceasing. Every second of every day, just thinking either what would God have me to do or thinking on the things of God. I should be more perfect about early will I seek thee and thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. These are duties. These are not choices. These are things that every Christian should not only desire to do, but that we have to do in order to keep our spirituality alive and not dead. If I cut God out of my life, my spirituality is going to die. But the more I'm invested in the things of God, the more my spirituality will thrive. But my commitments, my duties, should be more perfect. I may read it just the same amount as I did yesterday. But I may be able to get more out of what I read today than what I read yesterday because my discernment or my ability to learn from the things of God, discern from the Spirit that bears witness with our spirit, he could tell me more today because I've learned how to discern better yesterday. I may read the same amount of verses, but God can give me something more out of it. Or maybe he'll give me less, but that's going to have to last me a while. Just like that one meal that Elijah had. Doesn't matter. My duties should still be the same, regardless of the time. It should be constant. But I should get better at them as I consistently do them. Okay, just like weight training. It's easier to lift the weight after you've done it a whole bunch of times. But if you stop lifting the weight, you're going to lose the strength. I've just got to continue to lift the weights to do my duty as a Christian. What other aspects of our faith should be more perfect? Well, the answer is everything. But just in our ability to follow, I should be a better follower today than I was yesterday. God did not call goats who want a butt. God did not call Holy Ghost Juniors. What did he call? Sheep. I should be better if not only following the voice of the Lord, 
following the voice of the under shepherd pastor I should be better the Bible does say that we are to do all things as unto the Lord I should be a better follower on the job unless you're the boss man in which case you should be a better leader on the job but still even as a boss you should be following after Jesus but we're supposed to do all things as unto the Lord I'm supposed to treat every order of people that have authority or power over me as if it came from God himself. If I follow correctly, the world doesn't like to follow. But if I claim to be a Christian and I try to do my best, not just in the things of God, but in the things of the world, and the world says, why is this guy? He, he just wants to follow all the time. It's because that's what God told me to do. God will bless you. You won't have any problems on work because you're following. You're not trying to argue. And even if something does happen on the job, God will work it out for His glory if you've done exactly what you're... But we're supposed to be followers. We're not supposed to be leaders, usurpers, like Jacob was. God changed His name from Jacob. We're not supposed to be fighting for positions. Okay, The Apostle Paul wrote, Be wary of those that are men-pleasers. They're gainsayers. Not supposed to say things in order to receive from them. We're supposed to say what God wants us to say so He can do what He needs to do in somebody's life. If I'm following, I'll do what God tells me to do. I'll continue to walk after Him, to walk before Him, and to try and be more perfect. But the moment that my pride or my will or my desires rear up, that's when I stop following. I should be able to rein those things in easier today than I did yesterday. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life should not bother me as much today as it did yesterday. God told me he's made me a king to rule and reign over this body. Have I learned how to take dominion over the flesh more today than I did yesterday? Do the things of the world affect me less today than they did yesterday? If the answer is yes, it's because I'm living a separated life that God told me to, told me to because he said follow after him. If not, it's because I'm becoming more ingrained into the world and I'm becoming attached to it, not because God told me to go into the world, because God never wants us to be a part of the world. We're in the world, but not of the world. But it gets harder to follow if I've got the snares of the devil digging into me, holding me back. I should be better at following today. A whole bunch of more things that we could have talked about. But the point is, nobility is not saying, but I'm better off than Brother Tommy is. You're just the first person I looked up and saw Brother Tommy. I'm better than Brother Tommy is, so I can take a day off. According to who? Man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. Just because Brother Tommy's going through whatever Brother Tommy's going through does not mean that he's further away from God. Job's friend showed up and said, Job, what evil sin did you commit for God to do this to you? And then Job rebuked them and preached at him for a few chapters. Saying, I haven't done anything wrong. But it's God's prerogative to do what he would with my life. He may be in a bad situation. Doesn't mean that God's forsaken him or he's done something evil. All it means is that God has a plan for his life. And God's bringing that plan to fruition. Doesn't mean that he's further away from God than I am. Because yesterday I didn't have any problems. I'm not supposed to judge myself on other man. I'm not supposed to judge myself compared to the world. I'm supposed to judge myself compared to Jesus. True nobility is saying, I'm more like Jesus today than I was yesterday. I may not be all the way there yet, but I'm better than I used to be. Isn't that what God told us to do? To one, strive for Him, to seek His face. I can't find His face on the first day I get saved, but I can get closer day one and day two and day three. David was a man after God's own heart. He never found it, but he was getting closer each and every day. He found it eventually once he got to heaven. But in the world, he knew that he'd never get to God's heart in the flesh. But he still desired it. He still dreamed to be as close to God as he could be. And each day he got a little bit closer. He messed up. God had to send Nathan to preach to him. Guess what? After that day, you never find where David ever again turned away from God. He kept getting closer. Because his faith was more perfect when he repented than it would have been if he reared up in pride and said, I won't apologize for what I did. He knew he was wrong. 
So he told God, Lord, I'm wrong. Please forgive me. And then continue living on for Jesus. I should be more like Jesus today than I was yesterday. I should be more conformed to the image that God would have me to be today than I was yesterday. I should be more like that vessel of honor that he wants me to be. You can go and read the illustration where we're arrows in God's quiver. I should be more like the perfect arrow today than I was yesterday. God's not going to use an arrow that's going to fly crooked. I should be the perfect arrow today. I should be the perfect sheep. I may never reach sinless perfection in the flesh, but I can be more like what God wants me to be like today than I was yesterday. That's what a noble Christian desires to do.